And Palzel said to Ezra, you, you know, would you like to do China? Ezra had never taken a China course, didn't speak Chinese. Chinese is nothing like Japanese. I mean, a lot of Americans think, oh, you just go from one to the other. I mean, as you know, they are <laughs> totally different. And Ezra said, oh, uh, wow, China. <laughs> he said, so he said he might be interested. So Pelzel got on the phone, called Fairbank and said, you know, Ezra might be interested in this. This is all happening in the space of a long weekend. So Fairbank came over. He, he thought Ezra was a good candidate. And Ezra had to explain, uh, actually, I have to tell Columbia by the end of this weekend whether or not I'm going to accept that job. So they said, okay, you can have the Harvard job. <laughs> and I think that was when he really started to feel burdened that he was going to have to really work like mad to justify that appointment. I mean, he was so glad to have the opportunity to be involved in a great change. And he was panicked about having to appear as a China expert on the basis of a three-year fellowship out of the blue. You know, it was this constant need to prove himself worthy of that trust that kept him going. I mean, we knew he was a workaholic. Who doesn't know that? Uh, he was just very, very conscientious uh, from a spouse and kid's point of view, more conscientious than we would have liked. And this was shortly after Ezra had died. And all kinds of people were saying, you know, how much Ezra meant to him. I mean, professional people, former students, people who had been fellows at Harvard, this kind of thing, who I, who I just met him. And so I asked the kids, how, how do you feel when you hear all of these people praising your father? And I didn't even give them a chance to answer. I said, I'll tell you how I feel. I feel annoyed. And they burst out laughing because they felt exactly the same way. Why is he giving all of these people all of this time when we feel he's giving them our time? Thank you. Do you visit Japan often or do you? Mm, often. You do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, whereabouts in Japan do you go in? Tokyo, Kyoto, Kokushima, um, Okinawa, main places. Because we are doing a, a documentary about the Japan history, about the Meiji Restoration. Oh, you do exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So I interviewed many people there. Oh. <clears throat> I also went to many, some very old hotel. I mean, the Taisho period and the late Meiji Tai oh. period. A small house uh, told me, they told me when the early 20th century, some Chinese students stay here. Oh. So you have a very interesting job. Mm -hmm. Which university do you talk, visit? Which university? When you talk about your career, it seems very rational, <laughs> something very practical. What, what's your irrational part? My irrational part? Mm -hmm. uh, my desk is a little bit of a mess. Uh, I'm not organized, and my old papers are a terrible mess. Mm -hmm. And my wife keeps telling me, clean up your mess. Uh, she's a very good wife for me because um, she's smart, she understands, but uh, she treats me like an ordinary person. Mm. She doesn't treat me like a famous person. What does the fame mean to you? I mean, 1979, it's better that year. Suddenly, you become <laughs> so famous in those... Um, in Actually, it turned out to be kind of fun mm. because I was famous. I met all kinds of interesting people. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, the first time I became famous, I was 49. Mm. It was too late to change. Mm. You wish it happened in 29? No, no, <laughs> no. It's better it didn't happen mm. because then I, I might be you know, a different person. Mm. But uh, I, I, didn't, I don't think I acted like a famous mm. person so much because... All my life, my basic image, my friendship, everything mm. had nothing to do with fame. Mm. 
I don't have any special talent. In, in Japan, I think one, one advantage is I lived a natural life. Mm. So well, I think when I talk to Japanese, they feel very comfortable mm. because it's not a classroom Japanese. It's daily life, or learn from daily life. And to some extent, China is the same way. I tried to, to talk in a way that people actually talk to each other. Mm. So it was not always the best classroom language. Uh, and maybe some mistakes, but it communicates and you're wrenching work. So I, I think, I think my, my language, it helped my interest in intellectual life and ideas and curiosity. For example, how I would be with a bunch of Japanese men in the evening at a bar. Could it be such a thing? And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. It's kind of a um, questioning style, mm. and uh, in a way, it's more modest. Mm. They watch, you know, what the other person says and thinks very carefully, so they don't make a mistake. Mm. Chinese are way more straightforward. <laughs> More of a power. I mean, it was kind of an interesting, you know, at Harvard we have a, the young scholars, mm. we would have a lunchroom. Mm. And uh, somebody would say, oh yeah, well that's one way, mm. and here's another way of looking at it. Mm. He enjoyed intellectual playfulness of ideas. Mm. Mm. But I felt uh, getting to know people and talking to them was much more important. Mm -hmm. That also made me a little more skeptical about documents. Mm -hmm. Because some historians, they look at documents and say, well, was it in the document? Mm -hmm. But I realized that even in writing a document, you don't get the whole story. Yeah. The document does not tell everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the documents have some purpose. So that sometimes talking to people Maybe it's not as precise and not as accurate, but sometimes it can be deeper and you understand why the documents. So I, I kept learning from talking to people a lot, yeah. So it's very important, yeah. And in your book, you, you seldom show your scholar side. I mean, very straightforward and focus on the facts and... Uh, yeah. And yeah, why? Well, I think that's, that's uh, to what I'm trying to do is not so important. I grew up in a small town. Most of my high school friends did not go to a college. Some went to college. When, when I was writing, I would try to think, what can those guys understand? And always write, try to have stories, because in the United States, people, they didn't care so much about other people's point of view. If you say, you know, I don't particularly like my art, but if it's Americans at a bar, hey, what do you think, man? Don't don't think of it that way. Yeah, let's think of it this way. Yeah, let's, let's have another drink. That guy is crazy, man. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>没上班 看这个楼,它确定不来的。So what's your first impression on Guangzhou? 
I mean, in 1980, you went to Guangzhou together. Yes, that was part of a Harvard alumni tour, which, mm. believe it or not, was doubling as our honeymoon. We had gotten married only a month earlier, mm -hmm. and he thought this would be so exciting. We could spend our honeymoon in China. But it seemed very tense. Um, we just felt that people were very nervous around foreigners. I mean, we were Americans. Mm -hmm. We hadn't, well, we had only recently established diplomatic relations. Um, so I, I just think, you know, nobody quite knew how friendly they should be. You know, we both love interviewing. We both love hearing what people think about situations. I mean, it broadens your own perspective. But we had different objectives. He was trained as a sociologist. He was interested in the macro level. How were these major changes taking place? Mm -hmm. How was policy developed? This kind of thing. I am an anthropologist. My primary data source is the ordinary person. What is their take on what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, we were able to integrate. He would, you know, in the evening, he could say, wow, I interviewed, you know, Vice Governor so-and-so or the head of bureau so-and-so. And, and they <laughs> said, blah, 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 blah. And then I'd say, oh, well, you know, I interviewed these three families. But um, people were very nervous. He was never a person who, you know, was celebrity conscious. But he began to realize that he had access that a lot of other scholars do not have. And he did want to use that to benefit everybody, not just the United States, but specifically to promote good relations between the U.S. and China. You said before that you would study other countries because you want to use others' experience to maybe enlighten the United States. Yes. During the past five decades, you travel yes. deeply into China and Japan. Yes. And so what's the major things you want to bring to the United States, to Americans? Well, unfortunately, they don't listen enough. <laughs> you know, to, if I really want to try to make America, if I really had power mm. and really want to have fundamental I think the experience of the countries that were late developers, mm -hmm. where the country takes a more active role in trying to, to guide the whole country, mm -hmm. would be really good. For example, I, uh, we have good suburbs, we have good schools, mm -hmm. in poor neighborhoods, we have very poor schools, very poor teachers. If you had a national ministry of education, mm -hmm. you, would, you would really try to have a national program and you would have federal money, national money, to help the backward schools. So you'd have a much more equal educational system. Mm -hmm. So if I really had power, and really want to use the example of uh, Japan and China, mm -hmm. I would say the government should take a much more active role. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid America can't do that. I mean, we don't, we're not a late developer, mm -hmm. and now people have too much pride. But uh, in some ways, I think my vision is bigger. I mean, you know, it's a very important intellectual task for the whole world. Mm. The grand vision, mm. you know, like Toynbee in the West had a mm. big grand vision, mm. and maybe some earlier period had a mm. grand vision. But I think now people are not uh, looking forward enough. For example, mm -hmm. the, the bureaucrats I knew in the 1950s the, that generation who were thinking how you build a modern Japan mm -hmm. were really very broad. And the bureaucrats now mm -hmm. are much pettier. You know, they, they've become too small. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that, you know, there are historical changes mm -hmm. in different uh, time periods. Whether you have a broad vision makes a big difference. For example, you know, humiliation uh, it could be used in different ways. Mm -hmm. It could be used as a stimulus to study and to learn more, mm -hmm. to build a modern organization. Mm -hmm. The Meiji, is, as I say, it's a modernization mm -hmm. program and an integrated program and succeeded 
but then they had years of disaster mm. in the 1930s. They had taught patriotism so successfully that uh, the leaders could not control it. And uh, the defeat by the United States was so devastating, and they suffered so much. And then they had to revise, and now they have to accept a new role in the world. I mean, in a way, it's not so glorious. Japan must accept uh, China as number one in Asia, and America is a much greater, bigger country. They can be a modern country, but it's uh, not so exciting. Mm -hmm. How to adjust to this new world? They don't have a clear vision. I think in China also, um, China is new powerful, mm -hmm. and they have not yet become comfortable with their power. Now when they go to many other countries, uh, some of the instinct is, look, we're the big shot, please listen to us. Mm -hmm. There are some people like that, mm -hmm. and some other people say, now to get along mm -hmm. as we expand, mm -hmm. we cannot be too proud. Mm -hmm. That is a good way. But my impression is that they use a lot of slogans, mm. but they haven't tried to be systematic. They did not have an overall systematic plan about learning from the world in every single area. Geography, local customs, the value system, the religion, the family structure, how to use, how to persuade, and how to have deep understanding of people, their deeper feelings. Mm. Mm. Uh, for example, in the United States, propaganda is not a good way to persuade Americans. Mm -hmm. In the long run, this will not succeed very well. So they do not have yet the mature vision mm -hmm. about how to adapt to the rest of the world as they grow. From uh, America point of view, um, I think after World War II, in a way, it was kind of a peak. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the one great country in the world uh, mm -hmm. with modern industry. Mm -hmm. And now China will surpass America in some places. And uh, we don't have a plan. I think our leaders, they have an instinctive reaction from the Cold War. We won't let another country pass. And a lot of people in Washington just want to criticize China, mm -hmm. jump on China. But they don't have a vision of how to work with China now. I mean, from my point of view, if human civilization is not just about business interests, economic growth, mm. or new technology breakthrough. Mm. It's a broader conception. It's a kind of an intellectual development of trying to think the big picture of what is happening. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned the public intellectual tradition. In, yes. in 1960s, 70s, and your 80s, public intellectual play a very important role in understanding other countries. Now it become more marginal there is a deeper problem. I mean, comparing with the older generation, people think not curious about different behavior, mentality of others, civilization. We are very self-centered. From your perspective, how to deal with it? I, I, I don't know the answer. I wish I knew. Uh, I think it has to do with the new connection between uh, communication and, and uh, so forth. Mm. But what will be the basis of uh, healthy relations? Mm. It's true. I mean, in the last uh, 20 years, the world became chaotic. Mm. And out of the chaos, the people went off in different directions, so I don't know that answer. Mm. But I think uh, what I can do, and maybe have some impact, I hope, is how to deal with China. Mm. And there's some things Americans may not like about what's going on in China, but you have to be realistic. After all, China is going to be strong, and there are a lot of good Chinese people you can work with. If Zhong King fell back alive, what would he do? He... In a way, he, he did not have such a broad goal as I do. Mm. He wanted a better relation with China, but his uh, vision was more in terms of the field of Chinese studies. Uh, I would say one of the fundamental differences with Fairbank and me is he was elitist. He was uh, from higher class than I, mm -hmm. and uh, more, more. he went to Oxford and Broad Scholar mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, and I was a more, or a putungren, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
my father was a small Jewish merchant, mm -hmm. and I work in the store. And uh, my father had very good attitude of trying to get along with everybody mm -hmm. and to become very familiar and very friendly. It was a town of about 10,000, and uh, the small college, Ohio Wesleyan, which is a Methodist town, uh, maybe partly because it was a religious town, uh, there were many Christians there, although I was Jewish. It gave me a sense that uh, I want to be friends with everyone. Mm -hmm. And it also it was World War II. So we had friends who went to the war. We knew, knew people who died during the war. My generation after the war, we really wanted to have world peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some ways, I think, yeah, I'm so lucky. I grew up in such a small town in America. Mm -hmm. I was given the opportunity to experience in so many historical changes. Mm -hmm. And that to me means so much responsibility. Not because I thought that was so important, but because I thought the relations were so bad and I really want to make I mean that's that's an honest way. I, mm -hmm. I re really want those people to get along because there's so many good people in both countries. Mm -hmm. And there ought to be a better way and I and I knew a lot of people, I want them to get along. So maybe, maybe I'm uh, immodest, maybe I'm not correct, but uh, I think uh, I have a contribution to make. So do you think, I mean, there, there was a golden age between China and the United States, but now we have so many different complex between each other. So I mean, the, the transition, how the transition happened, it's, you know, of course, you know, every country like China and the United States is big and we have many different people. You know, the extreme rightists, mm -hmm. the extreme leftists. Mm -hmm. They don't have the confidence and the vision mm -hmm. to really develop a understanding of each other. So how, how to find a new path, you know, I'm afraid it could be so hard in the near future. But, well, it's also, you know, I think of the missionaries. Mm. Uh, I'll give you one example. I knew a Guangdong, a guy, a guy named Yang Mai. Mm. The exchange with people whose experiences are different from one's own is very illuminating. There are other ways to think. And I think that right now, that kind of attitude in this country is so necessary. Right now in the U.S. we are so divided that we cannot come to the middle. I mean, as we wrote China and Japan facing history, somebody needs to write the book now, America, right and left, facing history. Maybe I'll write that, no. But uh, no, it's, it's uh, people are so close-minded. And the sad thing is, it's not just the other side, it's one's own side. You know, we're not willing to even talk. Um, when Trump won the election, I was surprised, mm -hmm. but I immediately looked for all the books that I could find that related to what the other side might be thinking or experiencing and that might contribute to my understanding of why this was happening. Yeah. And I spoke to some, to a good friend oh, you know, I'm reading this and that and the other thing and trying to understand the other side. And she just looked at me and said, why would you want to understand the other side? They're all racists. End of story. And this is an intelligent person mm. whose opinion I normally respect. And she's still my very good friend. But wouldn't, I mean, why would I even try to understand another side? Surprised her. Mm. People are just absolutely closed. Hmm. That's, we don't need that. We don't need that in, a, in the same country. We certainly do not need that hmm. between China and the hmm. U.S. People need to understand why there are different points of view and how can you find a middle ground. I mean, we both sincerely wish people could listen to other people and respect their opinions or at least understand them. So you discuss the issue with Ezra a lot? You oh, very yeah. often? Well, I wouldn't say a lot. I mean, you know, 
we're sitting there at the kitchen table. I'm reading the Boston Globe. He's reading the New York Times. Now I have to read the New York Times myself. Um, hmm. And I'll say, oh, did you see this story on blah, blah, blah? Or Trump is doing X, Y, Z. Yeah, I mean, we would discuss them like that or something terrible. I mean, I am so glad. I mean, it's just gonna sound stupid. I'm so glad he didn't see January 6th. It would have broken his heart. Recently, I always think of Yang Mai. This is a guy who went to Yenjing University and mm -hmm. in, in, in graduated in the late 1940s. He was studying uh, Western economics, a mm -hmm. uh, free market economics. In 1949, he knew, oh boy, I will never get ahead. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will fail. Mm -hmm. So he became an engineer. So for, from 1949 mm -hmm. until the early 1980s, he had no zoyum, mayo fa hui zoyum. In Guangdong at the time of the late 80s, because he knew how markets operated. Suddenly he's useful now. <laughs> exactly. So mm. suddenly, you know, he would go to a county mm. and the guy, the guy in the county would say, you know, how do we get enterprise here? Mm. So he played a very useful, constructive role. And he was my friend. He was, he was my good friend in Guangdong. Uh, and I, I learned a lot from him. You know, in the whole world, there are so many talented people. Sometimes they have no chance, you know. Uh, it's sad, but they never, but sometimes some of those people have a chance later. So when I hear people say engagement didn't work, I say, it's crazy. Yeah, history has not ended today. Mm -hmm. Some of those people who had very good understanding, now they must be very careful but maybe 10 years later, they could play a very constructive role in development around the world. And now they it would need to be organized and to give them more opportunity, mm. more freedom to develop bigger ideas. So uh, I won't give up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, you want to see where he works. All right. Yeah, his working room. Here is the basement study. Pick that up. I'll put some lights on. Okay, so this is the place. This is where he worked. This is only part of it. Tons of books are in another part of the basement. And as you can see, it leaves a lot to be desired. Here's his machine. Where are the lights? Good God. I'm not sure I should tell you this, but he had the draft of the paper that he was preparing as part of a Harvard package that was to go to the next administration. Now that means Biden, but it could have been somebody. So he decided more recently that he wanted to work more on Chinese because he did feel an obligation. And he had a scheduled appointment with tutors on December 19th. But unfortunately, he died on December 20th. She called, she didn't understand why he hadn't answered. She just didn't think of that. Ezra passed away. All right, here we go. Well, these are supposed to work so that, you know, ideally he would sit here, he would look out, he would see this plant, and then he would be able to see the area there. He didn't really make much use of the view. <laughs> Usually this was just kept closed. <laughs> 